Glad to see y'all here this morning. Got a lot of people out vacationing and traveling and we pray that they uh, enjoy themselves and get back. We had a good vacation, uh, a little bit shorter than we expected. We, first of all, want to give God praise for Leanne's health because she did uh, test positive for COVID Wednesday a week ago. I guess this coming Wednesday will be two weeks, but uh, uh, we thank God we had uh, y'all praying for her. We also had ivermectin, and uh, we put her on ivermectin, and within three days, uh, she was doing a lot better. She didn't really ever have a lot of issue about breathing, uh, and she didn't lose her taste nor her smell. But the very day that she got tested positive, we put her on the ivermectin, and uh, we followed the 0.3 milligram uh, per kilogram of weight. Uh, that they recommended FLCC, uh, you know, I trust God gives us information that we need to take care of his people, you know. So I thank God for that. We had a vacation, a good vacation, <laughs> totally different than any of our other vacations because for, I guess, we missed the first two days, right? Uh, Waiting until... We made sure that she was clear, and I wasn't going to get COVID because uh, I didn't want to take it to my grandbabies. And uh, we got down to the beach, and the water was not really cooperative to what we was hoping. The crowd was not, because y'all know I like to shark fish, and so I did not put one pole in the water for shark fishing. I did some little fishing, but very little fishing for little fish. And, but we had a good time because we did exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to go down on the beach, watch my grandchildren, and sit like an old man instead of running like a young chicken. And so I sat on the beach. Uh, we rented a pontoon boat. That day it rained like a, a cyclone had come through. Uh, but, you know, we, we had a good time. The whole time it was just a, like an eagle song, peaceful, easy feeling. You know, it was just, it gave me what I needed. With all that being said, uh, you know, we were going to do Amos. We're going to do Amos, but I've realized something. I know nothing about the Bible. And unless y'all have done some serious side studying on the side apart from this church, you really don't know much about the Bible either because that's what I've been teaching you, not much. So what I want us to do is if you'll turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, uh, we're going to start there. We're going to start trying to lay some good, foundations so we'll know things now some of this stuff we know but we don't at least i've never really thought about it in amos amos came out of the tribe the the southern tribe of judah you know because the nation israel split and there was israel to the north there's no lost tribes by the way we know where they're all at ten of them went north Two of them went south. But that, that's, I want us to lay some foundation. <clears throat> I can promise you, if you can hang with me for a few months as we start doing some of this stuff, you'll learn. It, it might seem a little boring, but if you'll pay attention and try to take some notes, this, what I'm going to try to do is, is lay this out so that we'll have a foundation. So we reread, matter of fact, hold your place there in Genesis. Let's go and start having a lot of fun right off the bat. And, and let's go to Amos. Now, you know, when we started Amos, we talked about this was the denunciation of, of the nations, a judgment on the nations. Uh, let's, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of Amos. 
Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Okay. Where did the nation Moab come from? Anybody know? Do what? Lot's daughters, absolutely. The incestuous relations they had with their father after uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And uh, they got him drunk and had children. So the Moabites was not looked upon very favorably by the other tribes, you know what I mean? And they were not the original 12, but that's that nation. What about the nation of Edom? Anybody know where they came from? That's what we're going to find out this morning. The reason why we need to know these things is because the 12 tribes of Israel was one family that became one nation. All right? And when we know the history of these things, we can kind of, because at times we say, well, why would God say, destroy all those people and all their animals and everything they have, destroy every bit of it? Why would a loving God say such a thing? When you know the history, then you might know. Why did he? <laughs> we won't even go there. Let's go to tw Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Argum, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So, hey, they're going to have a baby. And the children struggled together within her, so she's going to have twins. And she says, If it be so, why I am thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, where did that word come from? From God. And he told her, she asked, Lord, why is this going on? Why are these twins constantly fighting in me? And when her days, in verse 24, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, they were twins in her womb. Well, who, who already told her that? She already knew. You know, they didn't have ultrasounds back then. So they didn't know. But she knew because God had told her. And the first one came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So now she has these twins. Now remember, God said the older was going to serve the younger, right? As far as we know, she didn't tell nobody. But that's what God gave her as an answer. Okay? The funny thing about how God sets things up is we laugh and say apples don't fall far from the tree, but we think it's because they see us or they know what we do and how we do, and so they start imitating us. Well, that's not always true. It, it's a genetic makeup that God puts in each person that's individual, but how he uses it. Some of the stuff I see my children do, they never did see me do, but yet they did it. I see my grandchildren doing stuff they never saw their parents do when their parents were small, 
but I did. But they do the very same things. Uh, Jacob took hold of Esau's heel as they were coming out. This was not something happened later in life. This was going on in the womb. They were worn and struggling with each other. We're going to see. We'll see. I don't want to get ahead of myself. When we don't get into the details, and when we skim, sometimes it's okay to act like you're flying in a jet and just get an overview of stuff and Reader's Digest. But to really understand some of the stuff that we need to understand, you got to know the history and spend the time. And in verse 27, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, I can see we're going to have a problem here. Can you? Uh, they're playing favorites. And Jacob sod pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Okay, remember when we was reading in Amos? We was reading about Edom and Edomites? Esau is the father of the nation of Edom. Okay, that nation was his family that continued to grow. So now we know where that, that came from. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now you know, it was always... <laughs> I'm trying to think. Oh, it was a cowboy movie and probably not a very good one. But the woman's husband died, and the, the judge of the land said, well, you know, it goes to the firstborn son. And the widow was really upset. She says, you know, his son cares nothing for this, uh, and I deserve it. And anyway, Jacob said, send me this birthright. The firstborn received the father's kingdom. The first male received the Father's blessing, the, the, the covering, the blessing, and everybody else served that one. Jacob said, send me this birthright this day. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day, and swear unto him. And he sowed his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. <laughs> he sowed his proper place for a bowl of beans and cornbread. The blessing of God he sowed for a bowl of beans and cornbread. It tells us in Matthew, what would a man give in return for his soul? What, what, what will you sell your soul for? Somebody said, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever sell my soul. And somebody said, well, I'd do almost anything for a million dollars or ten million dollars or to be rich and famous. And it says, what profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? But you know, we see Esau selling his birthright to the nation of Israel for a bowl of beans and bread. What would you sell your soul for? Well, I wouldn't sell it for no amount of money. But my mom used to tell me when I used to work at a, a nightclub, you're going into the den of devils. I said, Mom, it's just a beer joint. It's not the den of devils. But you know what? She was right. It was a den of devils. And you know what I was selling my soul for at the time? 
$40 a night and all I could drink in alcohol. Sad, ain't it? Knowing better. Knowing full well better. Well, what profit does it do me anyway? I got to feed my family. What a lame excuse. Get a better job. You know, what would you sell your soul for? Well, for no amount of money, but yet sometimes we see we'll sell it for a bowl of beans and cornbread, won't we? So Esau, Jacob gave to Esau the bread and pottage of, of lentils. Now the key verse here was back in verse 23 uh, of, of two nations inside your womb. It's going to be separate people. And then the next one we see would be uh, verse 30 where we find out that his name became Edom and uh, after this. And then, if you will, so Esau is Edom. Now, if you will, turn to Genesis 32, verse 28. Genesis 32, verse 28. And actually, we'll back up to verse 24 because I want to show you something here. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happened. Just refresh your memory before we read the Scripture. Jacob and his mother has fooled Isaac Isaac is dying. He's blind. So Jacob takes him and puts skins, animal skins, on his hands and on his arm. And Rebekah cooks a real fine meal for, for Isaac. And he goes in to receive the blessing from his father. Now Esau is out hunting, getting the deer and stuff to come back and make for his daddy to receive this blessing. But this was years later, but remember what he did. He sold his birthright, right? <clears throat> this is where it really gets confusing to, when you're trying to put it all into a physical sense because it's spiritual overrules the, the physical always. But anyway, so they go in, he brings the, and he receives his father's blessing. He receives his father's kingdom. He receives all that Esau was supposed to have, Jacob has now got. Okay, well now, when Esau comes in and, and, and Isaac says, I'm sorry, son, you've missed your blessing. I gave your blessing to your brother, even though it was deceivable. He said, well, hadn't you saved a blessing for me? And he says, I've gave the blessing to your brother. So he wanted to kill his brother. So his brother had to leave. Okay, so... He's left, but anyway, this is even after this point, or coming up to this point. Now in verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall, call, shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. So Jacob became the nation of Israel, his descendants. Okay? So now we see Esau produced the nation of Edom. When you go through the history, every chance the Edomites had when Israel was struggling, even though... The brothers ended up somewhat getting along. Edom always attacks Israel. They're all the time doing things to help Israel stumble and to fall. It goes all the way back to when they were in the womb. And God said, there are two nations in there, and they're different people, and one's going to be stronger than the other. And so Israel produced the strong nation. Edom produced... Uh, a, a weaker nation but now 
Jacob wrestles with the angel, and Jacob was hindered at that point, hamstrung, if you want, uh, and he, he walked with a limp every day after that he wrestled with the, the angel. But what did he do to his brother when he came out of the womb? Grabbed hold of his brother's heel, didn't he? That's this, this, it's just amazing. But now, Jacob, Israel, It was deceitful to his father, wasn't he? But didn't God already say the the older would serve the younger? Doesn't it also say that God loved Jacob and hated Isaiah or Esau? Esau I hated, but Jacob I loved. Right? Why? He's God, <laughs> you know, but as you can see, these nations, sometimes we wonder, how can these brethren, they're the same, same people, how do they keep fighting each other? Well, this kind of shows you why. It started in the womb. And it's like the Hatfield and McCoy, you know, it just keeps perpetuating itself over and over through each generation. They don't even know why they hate each other no more. They just know, I'm supposed to hate you. Why? Well, you're an Edomite. I'm an Israelite. You're you're a you're an Arab. You know we don't get along, even though their skin color is the same. You know they they live in the same land. So give me one second. I've lost my place. Got too excited. Okay. Verse 28, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon halted upon his thigh therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank which is upon the hollow of the thigh hamstrung until this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank so he always had a limp after that after he wrestled with the son of God or an angel or Christ himself uh, we know he didn't wrestle with Yahweh but uh, possibly with, with Christ uh, you, you, you do not get touched by the Son of God that it does not alter your life. That's why when I tell you if your prayer, the prayer can be so simple that even a child can be saved and once you're saved, you're eternally safe if you're truly saved. But you've been touched at that point. You're always going to be I don't like the word crippled but you're going to be hamstrung. You're, you're never going to be the same after you're touched. Was Paul, was Saul the same after he was touched by Christ? His life was radically changed. Jacob, after he was touched by Christ, his life was radically changed physically and spiritually. So now let's go to Amos. Chapter 1, verse 1. I know we've done this two or three times, but we're going to go on and start at this point, and Lord willing, we will move through the book of Amos over the next three to four weeks, but we are going to check on some of the stuff that I want us to look up as we go. Uh, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, 
king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. The earthquake has been recognized by Josephus and other secular uh, history writers uh, so they can place the timing, and I'm sure that it's of a great importance, but I have not researched that. Uh, but I, I do want you to notice, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, the son, king of Israel. Judah and Israel were separated, like I said, at this point. And uh, really, both nations uh, was considered kind of, in one sense, one nation, but it was a northern and southern tribe. Well, the northern tribe had ten tribes in it, or, or ten families, and then the, the south had two families. Now, the herdsman here, Amos, uh, he didn't come from preachers. Uh, he, he was a herdsman and, and a picker of figs, okay? Uh, that's what he did, but God used him. God can use anybody he wants. He was from the south, and he went to the north to preach about that. Now, what the north did was they started ignoring God. They didn't need God. Why didn't they need God? They were rich. Everything was going their way. They were seekers of pleasure. All right, whatever pleased them. Uh, there was open immorality. Uh, they were taking people captive that couldn't pay their bills and selling them off and, and making profit. They were prostituting them. They were just all kinds of stuff because, hey, they were living their best life now, you know? You get the pun, you know what I'm saying? And we think that as Christians and as Americans that we're supposed to have this best life now, regardless of who it may hurt. You know, the widows and orphans, God says, if you want to see pure, undefiled religion, is to tend for those. Why? They're helpless. The poor is helpless in a society like we live. You know? Do you want to get on God's bad side? Mess with poor people. Mess with the poor people and see who starts knocking on your door. And Americans, we've seemed to forget that and, and we want to pursue what's best in our best interest, my family's best interest. And we don't think about others. This whole theme of the book of, uh, of Amos is the denunciation of the nations. He, he's going to let the nations know. And when we get into this and start really looking at it, we'll see as he comes around the, the, the horn, so to speak, they're all saying, well, okay, well, yeah, they just, they, they, that's what they're like. And then when he comes back to them, well, wait, we're, we're God's children. Exactly. And we're God's children. Exactly. I just want to tell you, nothing's changed since vacation. And I, I want you to honestly know, I said it in Sunday school, my theme right now that God has laid upon my heart is from the two best preachers that I know of. John the Baptist, and Jesus Christ. And their theme, their message was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. All right? Judgment is not coming to America. Don't worry about that because it's come to America. It is here. All right? Now, if you're his children, he'll tend to you. You're not going to go around hungry. You're not going to be begging for food. But times are going to change in America. I think that's what God showed me on vacation. We wanted to go on vacation like we've always gone. Guess what? It was anything but like what it always was. Everything was there. Did we have a good time? We had a wonderful time. Rest and everything. But it was not the same. 
I saw something on a church sign. Did you see that? It was on a little Baptist church down there. Normal is not coming back. But Jesus is. That's what God has put on my heart for us here. He's, he's already cleared a bunch out because they wouldn't, couldn't hear what's got to be spoke. But for those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. All right? Judgment is falling on this great country. Is it over? Depends on you. All right? What do you mean it depends on you? If my people, remember where we started this a few years back? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. But you know, I just want to remind you, this is what we talked about, I think, right before I went on vacation. The week before Christ was crucified, He came in. They were saying, Ha! Ah, Hosanna to the King! Hosanna to the King! A week later, they were saying, Crucify our King. Why? Because they wanted a king to make their nation great. He was the Lamb of God. Now he's coming back as king. King of kings. American Christians, I'm very afraid, are wanting to make America great again instead of saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Are you a citizen of America or are you a citizen of God, heaven? That's where you're going to have to draw your, your line. Who do you serve? I serve a living God. And He'll deliver me through whatever is coming up, good or bad. Well, you're the preacher. That don't matter. He'll do the same for each one of you. If you'll sell out to them. We need to be praying for our fellow man. Like you was talking about in Sunday school. They're lost. They don't have a clue. They can't even tell if they're a man or a woman. It's sad. I saw a bunch of them down in Florida. And I look at them. And I'm not going to do it because you'll film it and put it on something. But they swish like a woman. They don't walk like a man. And we're talking about most of the males. But you know, go back in history once again. Do a little homework. Do a little due diligence. Let's talk about the two great empires. The Greeks. What happened to them? They became queer. Simple. And turned from God and worshiped a bunch of false gods. What happened to them? The Romans, what did they do? Homosexual sports, and you know, what happened to them? America. Are we going down the same path? We are, but can it be changed? It could be. Where is the change going to come? Well, if we had a great president, no, if we had a great Christian. Are you the Christian? Twelve. And in Acts it says those twelve have turned this world upside down. Twenty six, twenty seven, twenty six. There's only twenty six here. Oh, we're not big enough to do nothing, are we? Man, we're two times more than the apostles. We've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Can America be saved? Yes. What do we need to do? We need to make posters and go march somewhere, right? Nope. We need to pray. And then when God, we read this in James, 
for you to know to do good and not to do it, it is sin. When God speaks to you and tells you, you need to be doing this, do it. Don't be sinful. Do what he asks you to do. And we'll see this country change. I don't know, that seems like a whole lot of work. Look what that one crazy woman did. Got God kicked out of school, didn't she? Amen? Come on, what's wrong with y'all? Y'all act like y'all need to go to bed and take a nap. Are you tired? I know, I, I've, been, I've been blessed because I've been on vacation. But I, <laughs> when we was packing up night before last, I said, you know, this vacation stuff's a lot of work. I think I want a staycation next time. Just stay home. You know, uh, verse 2, and, and I'll stop this more because when we start next time, Lord willing, we're going to have a lot of details to cover. I'll try to provide a, a little note page for you uh, that has some stuff out to help you because we need to know the 12 tribes. Uh, we need to know some of the descendants and stuff because as we go through this, it'll make more sense of what we're looking at. And then what we're going to try to do is see if this parallels to the U.S. of A. today. And I think it does. I think it very much parallels because it parallels right. We didn't replace Israel, but Israel is an example to us. They were a nation that God formed. Jehovah God. U.S. was a nation that was, was formed under Jehovah God. The only two nations in the world that was ever formed to serve Jehovah God. Yes, we're a free nation, but we should have stayed close to Jehovah. We should have never let the other false gods in. Muslims, Buddhists, all that. I'm sorry. Oh, well, you're, you're, what's that word when you're a phobia of, of foreigners? That's not true. But you cannot let them come. When, when you allow all these other gods and then you close Christianity and Jehovah God down, you're chaos. Look at our nation. We're chaos. And it's no reason to be in chaos. God likes order. He's an orderly God. In verse 2, And He said, The Lord will roar from Zion, and his utter and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. He's roaring to get people's attention, even to this day. And we keep disregarding all of his warnings. There is a, a famine coming to the land. The famine has already hit. That's what I'd acknowledge to you this morning. We surface fed on God's Word. And we should have been digging deep into the soil into God's Word. There's a famine for God's Word in this land, in this church, in most churches. Most churches is not as well fed as we are. That's sad. So we're going to start laying the groundwork and there's another famine coming. Please be preparing for the food shortages. They're so brazen now, they're even telling you on TV it's coming. So unless you're a good hunter like Esau, you better be putting some canned goods up or you're going to be out hunting every day for something to eat. I'm not scaring you. I'm just telling you the truth. God wants you to know. God never does anything without revealing it first to his people. It's been revealed to us for over two years what was going on. I've tried to, to do it without acting like a chicken little and the sky is falling. But you know, when Israel fell into captivity, they served over 70 years. 
Some of their people never came out of Babylon. Will that happen here? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have that information. But I can look at their lives and see that they still worship God. And those that truly worship God lived exceptional lives even in captivity. My question is, do we want to try to stop the captivity by humbling ourselves now? Or do we want to keep headlong and like we're doing and then when it happens, just do the best that we can in that place. I say let's get on our knees and ask God to do something. And this is an individual thing. You have to surrender. And when you surrender, I promise you, people say, I don't know what to do. When you surrender, you'll know what to do. Because God will start leading you. And you can't help it. Look, what does he say he's going to do to the nations in the end times, to the leaders? Some of these leaders, they, they read this same book as we read, and they know. And so they won't move because they know. But what does it say he's going to do? And y'all know? Come on, y'all know. Because we're going to read about it in Amos, what he's going to do to some of the people there. He's going to put hooks in them and drag them to the scene. Some's gonna, and then their children will have fish hooks in them, dragging them to the scene. Why? God's in control. So do you belong to Him? If you do, smile this morning. Smile. It's okay. If you really believe He's got all that power, it's okay. If you belong to Him, He's got you, right? Jesus said, Everything that my Father gives to me. Are you one of them? If you're one of them, He says, I will no wise cast out, nor will I lose. I'll not lose one of them. Are you more valuable than a sparrow? God says so. God says you're so valuable, I've sent my only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved you so much he sent his son Jesus. He loves you so much he will chastise you if you don't do right. Our nation is not done right, so he's going to chastise our nation. Humble yourselves and thank God for the chastisement that's coming upon our land because it produces something. How many of y'all have great pleasure in spanking your children? Scott, do you? It really does hurt you to spank your children, don't it? But it produces something in them, doesn't it? A behavior. Well, it will eventually all the way. It produces the behavior that you're wanting. That's what God is doing to America. He made us a great nation. God made us the great nation. And if his people will humble themselves, he will continue to bless this nation. We're making some moves in the right direction. But we can't just say, all right, great. We got that big and done so God can bless us now. No, we still need to turn to God. There's still a lot more work to do. There's people that need to know the love of God. We have to speak the truth. You know what they teach our military now? that there are 726 genders that we need to be respectful of. Let me repeat that. There are 726 genders that our federal military is making our military people sit under and listen to their garbage. What are they doing? They are brainwashing our military to accept transgender. And if you think this is just something new, it's been going on for years. If you remember Hillary and Bill Clinton, they said, I, I, what's that? Don't ask, don't tell. But now it's out of the closet, ain't it? Matter of fact, they want to run around and tell everybody. Was it 762? I'm sorry. Okay, well, I inverted them numbers. It's even worse. Yeah, yeah, Section 8, he was trying to get out of the military, dressing like a woman. 
You said something, sir? Yeah. Mm. Well, they're letting transsexuals, transgenders dress up in full drag and go to our elementary schools and read books to them. I, I tell you, I guess we're going to have to learn how to grow our own beans and just eat our beans at the house because I can't really want to, I don't want to support all these. Can I say what it's true? False gods? Do I still have my what? Yeah. But you get hungry on Sunday. <laughs> I guess we ought to fast on a Sunday, maybe. All right. I'm going to ask Brother Johnny to come up and lead us in a song of invitation. Back, let's get serious for just a minute. If, if you're not being serious about the situation that we're in, it's time to get serious. I want you to know there's, there's a, <laughs> it was like we was on the pontoon boat out in the bay. We went over to this peninsula and we was having a nice little time. The beach was pretty over on the other side and, I kept watching the, the clouds, and I said, there's a bad storm coming. We, we probably need to be packing up. But well, we got to feed the baby, and we got to do this. And, well, we fooled around, and it was okay. God still took care of us. But I could see the storm coming. Oh, it's going to blow around us. I said, look, y'all, this one ain't going to blow around. And, I mean, when God opened the heavens, I mean, it was just, I mean, it was the water, the ocean water got cool. <laughs> It rains so much. Uh, some thunder and lightning. And say, I don't like being on a metal boat on the water with lightning around. You know? Uh, God gave me common sense. But uh, we couldn't go nowhere because you couldn't see from here to the, the, the road out there. The rain was so hard and the boats had no lights and stuff. I mean, so we had to wait it out, you know? Uh, but th that same kind of storm... I've been seeing coming. And I've been trying to tell everybody without being doomsday, but on the other hand, it is a serious situation. And each of you know people that you love and they're lost. We need to be praying for them. And there's people that you don't know that God's going to use you to introduce him to them. All right, and and we need to be serious about this because time is short. You know, for a while there, I thought I could, I had time to do this and set up some stuff for my children and my grandchildren. The time's at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Some of the stuff that you said you've been, want, you thought you'd want to see, you're you're seeing some of it, and you're going to see more. And, and and the things that I was hoping I'd never see, I've done seen. And, and, and there's more on the horizon. Uh, but once again, if my people, is everybody a Christian here? So you've took Christ's name. You didn't take it in vain, did you? So you are a Christian. So if my people who are called by my name, Christian, Christ, Christian, okay, that would be us. Quit thinking that we got this all worked out. We, we don't have the power to do squat. I know that people think, well, I'm going to take care of this. and Okay, we should be trying to take care of things. But without God's help, you cannot weather this storm. I don't care what you've prepped for. All right? But with God, we can weather this storm. Matter of fact, one other quick beach story. The radar kept showing this storm coming. And I asked God, I said, Lord, would you keep the storm off of us? For three days, it rained over there, and it rained over there, and it rained back there. Right in our little slice, it was partly sunny, but no rain. Oh, well, see, you're, you're just, I know. Little prayers with little thinkers. But God answers prayers. He's always answered my prayers. 
I know he answers your prayers. The problem is most of us don't pray. Right? And if you're saying this prayer, Lord, we want to thank you for this food. Now nah, lay me down to sleep. Maybe it's time we grow up and progress to some real prayers. And then pray, I'm going to tell you, you know that you're praying in the Spirit when you've prayed and all that selfish garbage comes out your mouth. But you stay there humbled in prayer because the Holy Spirit uses you there. And He'll reveal to you things that you need to pray and for people and what they're needing prayer for. And it's not always bless me, bless me, bless mine. Bless me, bless me, bless mine. And when you start praying for other people that's in desperate need and you see God touch them, somebody's faith grows. And I'm not talking about the other person. It'd be your faith. So if your faith is weak, take your eyes off yourself and start praying for those that are helpless and hopeless that need something from God. You've got the something that's needed from God if you're a Christian. Use it to glorify your Father that's in heaven. Brother Johnny. Kneel at the cross Christ will meet you there He intercedes for you Lift up your voice Leave with Him the cross leave every care kneel at the cross Jesus will need